call this meeting of the Upshur County Board of Education order. Our first order of business is to stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let the clerk note that all members are present. On to the approval of the agenda. Do you have any adjustments? Or? I do. Uh, in your agenda, item 11, I'd like to delete the item of the Innovation Zone grant application from Buckhannon Upshur High School. That does not uh, take anything away from the other two Innovation Zone grants, but we found that there was a little bit of conflict between the two grants and competing for the same dollars. So since they were similar, very, very similar programs, we wanted to go with the county level grant. So we're, we'd like to pull that off at this particular time. And then there are some additional items and strike throughs on attachment F under personnel. And that has been placed in front of you. Also under that same attachment F on the back page, there is a uh, list of West Virginia Wesleyan College clinical students, student teachers, and nursing students. Do I hear a motion to accept the agenda as amended? Motion to approve. Second. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? We'll move on to item five, which is announcements, acknowledgments, and highlights. Uh, first, an announcement. As you know, we had our annual convocation today, and it was a pleasure seeing all 550 employees gather in one place and are ready for the new school year. Uh, it was an exciting morning that, that I thoroughly enjoyed uh, being with those folks. And they spent the rest of the day working in staffs, going over uh, new changes and new policies, and I think it was a good day. But the major announcement is school starts Thursday. So uh, that is a full day of instruction. And I know that all the students that are here with us tonight just can't wait. Looking forward to getting up early. We will be serving breakfast and lunch. It'll be a full day. All the buses will be running regular schedule. And I would hope that the community would be aware that their little ones will be out at the bus stops early in the morning and take extra care as they're, as they're, as they're driving. Also like to introduce to you once again, uh, Deputy C.J. Day. C.J. will be joining the ranks at Buckhannon Upshur Middle School as our pro officer, and we'd like to welcome him to Upshur County. Thank you, C.J. And then the other announcement is actually a, a, a brief presentation from last year's Youth Leadership Institute. If you remember, this board supported a group of high school students to go uh, through a leadership a governmental leadership academy whereby they went to several different governmental agencies and they're here tonight to give us a report on that so uh, i'm not sure who the spokesperson is mr edwards that will start it off uh what i want to do before we get started because i promised mr lampton in that i would make this as short and brief as possible he doesn't know me very well but, um what i have here is a little bit of a swag bag that we were given uh, that we gave out to all of the students who attended all 13 I might add that enrolled in the class, graduated in the class, and attended every class. As a review, if you want to pass those down and take a look, that'd be fine. Um, as a reminder, it was a six-week course. Every Wednesday, we had the children come out to a different governmental function. Um, right in the middle of it, we had a break, which, of course, was spring break. It's a pleasure for me to be here tonight, Ms. Madam President, members of the board, guests to introduce you to these four and to give you a brief idea of what we did and to thank a lot of the people that helped out in this program. As you may be aware, there are a lot of governmental institutions that took or were involved in this, so it's a real collaborative between not only the Board of Education but these different entities. So first of all, I want to thank uh, our committee who pulled all of this together and it was the, uh, of course, the Youth Leadership Institute Committee. Uh, we couldn't have done any of this without them. Of course, that would be Amanda Hayes, David Taylor, Ron Pugh, Michael Calger, who fortunately for us supplied pizza every week after school for these kids to eat afterwards, and of course us, Matt Kerner, Keith Nichols, and Mary Aubaugh. 
I also want to make sure we uh, thank the Board of Education for your support with us, and of course, Mr. Lampin and Mr. Wilmoth. They were the first week to meet with these folks and sit down and had a long discussion, about two hours, of all the different policies and procedures that they do for the schools. So uh, I, I think that was a really fantastic uh, opportunity. I also want to thank the County Commission, Donnie Tenney, Willie Parker, for uh, their presentations. I also want to thank the City of Buchanan, Mayor Davidson and Michael Doss for their presentations. Matt Gregory also, at a later date, presented with us. The Airport Authority, when we were out there, Dick Bennett and the Life Flight crew. Uh, the De Developmental Authority of Mr. Foster, who, uh, who also gave a, a little lecture. The County Courthouse with Judge Cato and Sheriff Miller. And West Virginia Western College for all their support that you see some, some of that. We couldn't have done any of this, of course, Country Roads Transit. You might have been aware that if the kids didn't have transportation, after school, they were providing the transportation to each one of these events. So without them, a lot of this could not have happened also. And of course, I want to participate, I want to th thank our participating students. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. They are your youth ambassadors by proclamation, as you see. And I'm going to ask them to just tell you one thing that they really enjoyed about the class and if they'd like to see it continue. So ladies and gentlemen, Dan and Dolce, and I learned a lot about our county and how it works. And, uh, I just learned a lot about the county and like, and like how the school system works and how everything functions. And, <coughs> so. Thank you, Daniel. I'm Megan Bomer, and I really enjoyed the week five, which is the courthouse and the tour and when Judge Cato spoke and the sheriff and the chief of police and I really think this program should be continued. I'm Lizzie Edwards and I enjoyed the first week which was Mr. Lampin and Mr. Woman because it gave you an insight on the, soul, the school system that as students you don't really like think about and it's like some of that stuff has to happen you don't like it but it makes sense. <laughs> um, hi I'm Chris Eddie and I don't think there was a week out of this whole entire program that I didn't thoroughly enjoy, especially considering that I am going to go into the legal system as an adult. And so I really got hands-on information about the government, everything from small town government to school government. And all in all, I learned more in this six weeks than I think I could have learned in any college class or any high school class. And I absolutely think this program should be continued without a doubt. It was a really phenomenal program. Thank you. Amanda, did we happen to do the... Um, I thought while we were going to talk, we were going to give you an idea. Each week, we took pictures, of course, with all the kids, with each one of the presenters. And I thought if uh, we could go ahead and put that up while I'm uh, discussing a little bit of the other. Now, as you realize, there's a huge collaborative there of each of the governmental entities. And I want to make sure I thank them again for participating and volunteering their valuable time for us, particularly Judge Cadle, Chief Gregory, Sheriff Miller, the mayor, the city treasurer. We couldn't have done any of that without them. If you'd like to take a look um, behind us, as I mentioned a minute ago, our session one was with uh, Mr. Lampin and Mr. Wilmot. Uh, they were both given an hour each in our two hour time period. Uh, then our second was, I would also like to remind you that all 13, that is the first week there. We sat in the, uh, in the auditorium and had a really nice round table discussion and all the kids got an opportunity to participate. Um, the second week we had, um, what was that? That was at City Hall. Uh, there's a little dance we came in there. Right? <laughs> you know, two hours, I didn't realize, two hours is a pretty long time to have since you were sitting down there. People. So luckily, not halfway through, we had a pizza and all of that. Jesse Chu was with the mayor and was with Michael Doss, the treasurer. They both very, very cooperative with the kids and asked a lot of questions. But they gave us a whole lot of insights into the city government and how that works within the schools and for kids. Our third week, uh, there's a picture of the mayor and Michael Doss. All smiles. We see a couple of our fellow adult ambassadors there, Ron Pugh, David Taylor. Um, they were instrumental in going through this program. Of course, they're all with them. Up there, I am with the picture anyway. Our third session was with J.C. Rafferty and Donnie Tenney. 
Um, and as you know, those gentlemen um, can give you a lot of information, but I think the progression from city to the county government was really ideal on that. Mr. Parker came in along the last, gave us a tour of the place, and gave us an idea of what a county administrator does. Right there, they're up in the magistrate's court, in that picture right there. Uh, then we went down into the uh, title document area, what that called? The titles, the record, record, records, and stuff. Then we got to see some old 1800 deeds and property transfers in there, so you can see how long that's been going on. Session four was at, uh, out at the airport. That was our life flight instructor who gave us an idea a little bit about life flight and what all they do and how important it is for Upshur County and our community. Um, Dick Bennett also gave us all a tour of the facility and gave us an idea about what exactly and how important our airport is to our area and our community. Um, I think a lot of us might forget that the airport is now, you know, one of the, the cornerstones of our community and will help us in our area. Session five, what the real life like? You don't know, want to even take a ride, as you can see, it was a little chilly that day. Uh, session five, of course, was uh, Judge Cadle. Um, he gave us a lot of information on what it is that uh, the judicial system does here in, in Upshur County, and as you, all, most of you are all aware, he uh, used to deal with a lot of the fun stuff in the county. Uh, there they are in front of, in his courtroom. Um, we could, he could have been more hospitable to us and answer any more questions. And as you might notice, all 13 of our students were there again. We did have one homeschool student with us. That was the one on the far right. That was Wendy Nipperson. Of course, our own very own Chief Gregory was there and gave us an idea of how his work goes through the community and with our uh, what he looks for in particular with the juveniles. And I'm going to guess that we have shows, not shows, but um, that gave me an idea a little bit of uh, the dates that we did this. And I apologize for not coming to you earlier, but this summer for me, I don't know about y'all, but it's really flown by. By the time I can pull everybody together, I have to come to give this review for you. Thank you for uh, thank you for that, Amanda. Um, so as you can see, everybody was smiles there. I think everybody had a really good time. Uh, the two hours seemed to be very conducive for it. Um, what we're looking for now, we have already had discussions with Mr. Lampening and Mr. Wilmoth on how perhaps we can continue this program. What would be an ideal way to do civics at this level for our high school students and perhaps even for the middle school at some point? Um, it would be our idea to do it two times a year. That way, because we lost a lot of the students that we would have had in the springtime for sports that were there, and then of course, vice versa, the spring sports kids we couldn't make it for the fall sports. So we would like to do it two times a year, or do a year-long club type, where for three weeks you discuss what it is each one of those different entities does, and then that final week, that's when you go to the city hall, and then you might have a little bit, or they might have a better idea of how that area functions, and they might have more questions and be able to kind of tie it all together. I'm afraid that the information that we gave them during these presentations might have been a little overwhelming, as you might imagine. There's a lot of things there that youth or that our youth may not understand as far as taxation and a lot of the different paperwork and, and the structure of government. So uh, with that, um, unless you have any other questions or any of the students would like to say anything, Amanda Hayes, would you like to mention anything? Yes. Let me make sure in my notes I have covered everything and thank everybody I need to thank on that. I did do that. And if I might have two minutes after they are dismissed to discuss the pool runs with you for a second. Or just about the review. I'm not going to discuss it. I'm just to tell you a little bit about that. But if you're done with them or if you have any questions for me, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Ms. Bowling, would you want to say something? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I came in right here. Okay. Um, yes, I participated in this program this um, past spring, and I just I really enjoyed everything that came and was offered through this program. And anytime you can connect our high school and have the have Wesleyan come in and help set up a program like this is definitely a positive influence on our students and 
thank you for allowing this pilot program this past year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very much. I just wanted to mention also, we also I was also involved, involved in another program this year, and of course Mr. Lampman and the board uh, uh, gave us permission to use Academy and the inter, uh, middle school as bus stops during the pool runs this summer. I gotta tell you, I haven't got the numbers on that yet, but it turned out to be a great success and a very viable idea for every summer for those kids who may not have transportation to the swimming pool each year. Um, I do know that the stocker numbers were high, and I do know that also, the housing authority was involved and was very high. So again, another collaboration between not only the Board of Education, but the housing authority, the city of Buchanan, and Stockard New Center. So as you can see, I'm involved in trying to tie a lot of things together as far as collaborative issues with governmental entities. And I hope that will continue. Uh, next year, we hope to expand that program a little bit even farther. Perhaps we can hit Southern Upshur County, where some of those kids have a little bit more difficult time with transportation to the swimming pool. So with that, if you have any questions for me from that, I appreciate your time, and thank you for your support in all our endeavors. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Thank, thank you. you. All right, we'll move on. Uh, our facilities update, Mr. Moran. Thank you. I'll start with the smaller things, and then do a bigger one at the end. Uh, as far as appearances of the schools, you'll look around and you'll see that that's been progressing. It should be completed by tomorrow. I uh, know Washington District was done today, and, and Frank Creek should be the last one, and that'll be it. So tomorrow we should be done and squared away, hopefully, for the most part, um, with maybe just some minor details for the outsides. Uh, the gym floors are completed, and I believe are at least practicing on it now, uh, at least the middle school, and hopefully tonight, the high school, they should have been able to start. Uh, driver's ed course is completed uh, except for we got to get the arrows and the lines down. That's on order. And one of the nice things that is going to occur is we'll have those permanent. Um, we're getting, because uh, of our pricing system with the state, we can get the arrows and the uh, you know yield signs and those types of things burned in. And uh, that'll only enhance the driver's ed course as opposed to us going out and freelancing it. Uh, the treatment plant was completed at Union and it's functioning. So uh, that's a good sign considering school starts two days. Um, the paint list, I'll have a completed one and, and update you at the next <coughs> meeting so you can see all of what the paint crew did for the summer. Uh, it's an enormous amount. And I asked Dale Morgan to go ahead and create the list and I'll present it to you then. And then um, I was asked about the uh, state, the, the tree initiative program that we utilized and I'll update you for the next meeting on that because I have to update the state here in the next couple weeks on that to let them know what we're doing as well. So it'll all go hand in hand and tie in. Um, the hedges that, that you'll notice at the high school are gone, completely removed. Uh, we're still doing some of the dress up and clean up and, and that'll probably take till the end of the week, if not to the first of the next week. And then hopefully we'll have the uh, bigger ticketed item in place by the time that first home football game runs around. Um, and then I'll add this last one in. Uh, one of the things that we added at the middle school and the high school this year are, are two at the high school and one at the middle school, which are water fountains. And that may not sound a little corny to you, um, but what we did, what what it is, is actually a, a refillable station. Um, there are two refillable stations in the commons area at the high school and one in the, the um, middle school cafeteria. So those are students that carry, you know, a normal water bottle or a stainless steel water bottle or a staff member or anybody in the building can just go right up to it fill up, walk out. And hopefully that'll start to take our, our you know, um, footprint down with, with recyclable materials and plastic bottles laying around. And then on to the MIP. Uh, that's the big one that everybody, including myself, stay up and wonder what's going on. Um, the four schools have been completed, which are uh, obviously, again, French Creek, Rock Cave, Tennerton, and, and Union. Uh, we're still working out some of the um, punch lists and, and trying to rectify those situations as quickly as we can and uh, hopefully without any inconvenience we're still going to have some but we'll get them uh, knocked out and accordingly. Academy and Washington were started as of yesterday. They're working in here 
tonight and whatnot. They'll be working uh, basically four days a week, 10 hour shifts. And they'll do everything that they can before they rip stuff out. They'll work above the ceiling. Um, that way they don't have to go ahead and put stuff back in. They can just slide a piece of tile back in and, and get out. So um, when we get to that point where we're going to be ripping and tearing it all over, <coughs> uneasy at times but we'll be squared away the best we can and the contractors have spoken for the most part um, without talking to Mrs. Skidmore yet in, in direct uh, because of her busyness but we have talked to uh, Mrs. Hall out at, at Washington so she knows the schedule and she knows directly who she needs to speak to so that they're aware of exactly what's going on and what to expect in their during the school time and I think that's it Ahead of us. Keith, you said four tens. Would you share with the board what those shifts are going to be? Yeah, uh, the four tens will be evening, so they'll come in at four o'clock and they'll basically work till two. Thanks. Most will be out. We may still have a few, but we won't have the contractors anywhere near. If they are in an area where we typically have them, then we would re we'd move the kids and make sure that everybody's in those areas. But that will limit some of the evening programs. But usually what they'll do is they'll work on the schedule with the principals, like I said, to move in different areas where we don't have conflicts. And our bus is here, last bus is before. So if they're starting before, we'll pass them. Yeah, we'll pass them. Yeah, we'll pass them. Just if I may, under the facilities update, we've talked um, in the last couple of meetings about pulling that property to committee together. Uh, we spoke with the surveyor again. We're still anticipating those maps that we talked about so that we can pull that committee together and get moving on that. Uh, they still haven't been, we don't have them yet. We also want to make sure that we have all our vocational education teachers on board Buckingham and Upshur High School because they're going to help us with that, with that development. And we're starting to talk with some other folks about uh, maybe expanding that committee, some of the things we talked about early on. So that will, we, we anticipate that happening. Uh, we're very hopeful within the next two weeks getting that committee going so that we can make some decisions there. All right, uh, we'll move on to financials. George, do you have anything you want to share? Uh, the only thing on the agenda is a couple miscellaneous uh, budget supplements for some small grants that we've gotten for, for the county and for the Just remember, that we uh, accept the financial items as presented. Second. 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 All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, we'll move on to the consent agenda, which is the lease agreement with Fred Everly. This is an annual agreement that we have with Fred Everly. Uh, they, if you, as you know, we have our alternative education program in that building behind Fred Everly, and this is just that agreement to be able to use that building to uh, continue it out, out there. We'll tell you that some minor and some maintenance things were taken care of this summer that we had some concerns about, so that building is ready to go to start the school year. Um, do I hear a motion that we approve the consent agenda? Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? Who was the second? I, I think I was the second. I, think, uh, yes. I made the motion, Tammy second. Uh, we'll move on. We have the third reading and approval of the revised uh, policy 4003, which is the attendance. And that's attachment C. That, that policy has been out for the, for the uh, required number of readings and comments. We've received no comments on it. Uh, as, as you know, the only change in that is we're taking out the section that deals with the exam policy at Buckhannon and Upshur High School because they've changed their policy there. So I guess we will um, approve that. Do I hear a motion to approve? Motion to approve. 
Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Uh, move on to item 10, which is the Dropout Prevention Innovation Zone Grant. Ms. Akers. We provided you with a brief summary to help you review the grant. I'll leave this here at the front. This is a support page and a copy of the entire grant. Mr. Lampinen had sent an email earlier this afternoon with the completed, revised grant. I want to start off by thanking our committee who's spent countless hours working, um, looking at data, making this possible. That's groups from our middle school, high school, community members um, that have taken a real active role in this, so I uh, really appreciate all the time that's went into it. Um, I'm also really excited to say that today after convocation, when we had the faculty meeting with the middle school and high school, we didn't get the results until this <laughs> afternoon, but both schools unanimously voted to accept this dropout prevention grant. So that, to me, speaks volumes. Um, so we're very pleased with that as well. The summary page, and that's what I'll just highlight a few of those key points, and then if you have questions, um, please ask and we'll give you the clarification, but the project vision of this grant um, is to illustrate the connection with destination graduation that we promoted all of our board meetings throughout the county. And as you remember, that was created back in the summer of 2011 from our guidance department at Buchanan Upshur High School, and it is now a countywide initiative. And it's helping to increase the awareness of the dropout prevention and having our students graduate, thus earn a high school diploma. It also couples with our public forums that we started last year and will continue to have this year. We actually have our first meeting scheduled for next week to start looking at a September form to see if we can get one planned in time for the September. Our goal is to have four this upcoming year to continue that discussion with our community and our schools um, to look at the needs that we have so we can better address those. And it also highlights that through our vision that we do have several programs already in place in our school system. Um, but the one area that we found that we really focused in on this grant was connectedness in the school climate. That's where the data was, was leading us to as you review the data. The goal is to improve the school climate at our middle and high school and to increase our graduation rate by 2% yearly. And we feel that is um, a goal that is attainable with what we're hoping to achieve here. The key features, uh, we'd be hiring a full-time dropout prevention coordinator who will help facilitate dropout forums, work with our staff, um, all the stakeholders involved, uh, work with key advisory groups, setting up different advisory groups to look at what changes do we need to make within the school. So they'll be completely focused on that dropout prevention talking directly with the students, the staff at both schools. And then there's two waivers that we're going to apply for um, through this grant. They both are um, connected with policy 2510. And our first recommendation was to add an undecided career path. And this would allow for those students who decide to switch their pro from professional to skilled, would give them that opportunity in their major to explore other areas and it wouldn't jeopardize them or put them behind in their graduation date. The other um, policy uh, waiver that we asked for is a waiver with the 8100 instructional minutes to give us some flexibility as we're pulling these students out to work in these committees um, that they wouldn't be penalized for not having that 8100 minutes. And then the vision and the needs assessment. As Mr. Lampin and stated today in convocation, we have made strides with our dropouts. Um, we have went from 82 back in 09-10 to 61 last year. So we have made a huge, we're making a big impact, but we know we still have further to go, and we're hoping that this grant can help us um, get even further with that reduction. Um, it is linked to the strategic plans of both schools and the county strategic plan with its graduation goal related to increasing the graduation rate and identifying and supporting our at-risk students. We talked a little bit before when we talked about this grant about our data and what really jumped out at us with our 2010-11 
um, data from the state, and that's where we were ranked at 67.4 with our graduation rate, which was the lowest in West Virginia. We knew we have to continue to work on in this area, and our dropout weight rate was 3.7, the third highest in the state, with the dropout average at 2.2. Again, we've made significant strides, and I'm very pleased where we are, but I have high expectations of where we're going to go with this. Um, we use national research statistics to support the need for the students to be connected to school and also through the frontline network, the ABC, um, which is your attendance behavior and class failures. That data was also reviewed and will be a big part of, of this grant. We gave you section four, which outlines our objectives and activities. So if you have questions as you look through that. The full grant will be submitted as soon as we get our full signatures. We're asking you for your support. There's a document that we'll have to have signed. Um, and our deadline for electronic submission is August 31st. So we're right on track. And we've been in consultation with um, the state representative also who's given us some guidance as we've moved forward with this. Any questions? Mr. Long's looking at me like that. We, uh, sometimes the Bow County is considered worse than anyone else, but we were lower than Bow. My goodness, okay. That was 2010 11. Yeah, that uh, history. That's the best. Yeah. Great progress. <laughs> yes, definitely. Actually, slightly better. Yeah, it's better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. just like to add that I'm just very excited and thrilled and I think it's fantastic that the faculties as large as they are uh, well over 60 if I can at Upshur Middle School and well over 80 if I can at Upshur High School <clears throat> all see the need for this and voted to support this grant uh, unanimously uh, I just think that's very very telling that they're, they're very supportive and, and want to do something different and want to try something. So I, I commend your staff and the high school staff and the committee that's worked so hard on this. There's a lot of work gone into it. Yeah. Really appreciate that. Um, so do I hear a motion to approve the uh, dropout prevention innovation zone? So moved. Um, second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Could you clarify the second for me, please? Mr. Long. Let's move on uh, the uh, Innovation Zone grant for Union Elementary. Dr. Stankus. Thank you for having us this evening. I have my team of teachers here with me, and um, they're going to help me describe the objectives of our grant. Um, this is our uh, continuation of what we've done before with the Innovation Zone grant that we currently have. And we've found that these practices have been very effective and we're kind of expanding on what we're doing already with the genre studies and um, designing our own curriculum at Union. And we've been working on this all summer as a school and as a leadership team. We have been uh, just designing this and one of the um, things that we're, it's called Union Eagle SOAR. And SOAR stands for Seeking Outstanding Achievements and relationships and we believe achievement student achievement is the center of everything we do but right next to that is that relationship that between teachers and teachers and teachers and students and also our school relationship with community that's very important in our stakeholders so um, we're looking at um, the research based on Bill Daggett's rigor and relevance and and the fact that what we teach needs to be relevant to our students because they're growing up in a completely different world than you and I grew up in and how we need to really address those differences. So um, we, are, we are doing a few different things and we're asking for a couple different waivers, but um, the two waivers, one is a state code and the other is a, um, 
that, that's one. And I believe you have this electronically. I have a couple of um, hard copies. The West Virginia um, Department of Ed policy allowing flexibility um, regarding our adopted textbooks to implement this program use, using other resources, and that's kind of what we're already doing now. We want a continuation of that. But additionally, we have asked for a state code waiver um, with our hiring practices. Within the next um, five years, we see the potential of many retirements at Union. We're hitting that most of our teachers have been there a very long time. And um, so what we want to do is really protect the culture that we have in our school. And in that, um, we see a generation of teachers that have gone above and beyond. And that's just the way they've done things. And we want to protect that by adding just a few more things, not, not really changing the hiring practices, but adding a few more things that we really are looking for at our school. So that's what we're adding to our, um, our grant application. Um, I'm going to ask my teachers to step in and kind of go over the um, objectives of our grant as they're, they're written. If you look at the first two objectives, we were fortunate enough over the summer to be a pilot program for a program called MyOn. And it's basically a reading program that allows students on any digital media to upload books and be able to read them if you would of sorts compared to like a Kindle, except it's you know, based on levels um, that we as teachers could assess and that it moves them on levels based on how they're assessed at the end of reading a story. And the computer program automatically moves them on or gives them more books based on that current level. Um, we were able to receive this free for the summer being a pilot program, but of course, in order to continue, it is going to be a fee. So part of our grant was to be able to continue this. The program has actually improved itself to where you can download the books and they will be, they will stay on um, the devices, any type of multimedia devices. So we're looking at something handheld as part of our grant. And that way the students don't have to have the internet at home but they can take the devices with them and still be able to have the reading material, take the assessments, and continually move on their level. We've also provided insurance for these devices as part of the grant because we all know that allowing our students to take those home could also provide for accidents. They'll um, replace the Apple iPad two times for every single one that we buy. It can be replaced two times, even no questions asked, replace right. people. No matter what happens to it. So um, so basically it's like giving a two chance you know, <laughs> opportunity when you take that home. Um, but it also, like I said, the main point of that is it targets their reading level and gives them feedback and also either um, reassigns the current reading level they're on or advances them to the next. Um, the, we also wanted to involve the community in this objective, and we decided that it would be important that we provide um, this program and these devices at our local libraries. So part of the grant is also providing um, a, a digital device like an iPad at the local library um, to be used in conjunction with their computer systems where um, students and parents can go log on to the reading program. So it wouldn't only be accessible to students at our school, but it'd be accessible to all students within our county or even other counties who use our library services. But we're generating, you know, we're trying to hit all students because we're looking at those literacy components. We were fortunate this summer to be able to attend the Model Schools Conference in Florida, and there we deepened our understanding of the importance of rigor, relevance, and relationships in teaching our students. And we learned how to um, teach students in such a way that um, we really promote the higher level thinking skills from Bloom's taxonomy. and. Um, to move our students from just a knowledge-based learning into the, what they call the quadrant D, which is where the students are not only taking what they've learned and applying it, but also being able to apply it in a new and different way, in maybe an unexpected 
solve unexpected problems. And to further this aim, our second goal is to provide relevance in our learning activities for the students through the use of quadrant D learning and um, real world application through career and college readiness. And so one component of our grant our, uh, in the second objective is to um, further promote the and use the Lego system of learning in our classrooms. Several of our teachers were trained in, o, in Florida um, in several components of the Lego education program, such as Build to Express, where um, after you've taught a concept, the students can use a, a little Lego set to build um, a model of what they've learned or what their reaction to it, or their reaction to what they've learned. We also learned um, how to use the Lego kits to promote um, storytelling and writing, to understand better what they've read, and to be able to tell their story through the Legos and then be able to write it. Um, at our Innovation Zone Academy last week, we were trained by Jenny Nash, our whole staff was from Marshall University, in the Lego Robotics program. And we're going to start that this year at our school through the Innovation Zone grant that we are using this year. But we would like to extend to these opportunities to, and to our students to deepen their learning. And that's our second objective. Our next objective is to use campus visits to expose children to um, further career opportunities that await them and to be able to take that story that they're envisioning for themselves a step further and allow them to create a vision of themselves attending a college of their choice. And so we'd like to start and take every grade level um, to a different college and have them experience some different experiences there so that they will be able to feel comfortable in the college environment and be able to know that they can attend college because it's important that we prepare them for a future where lots of times the jobs that we tend to think about, pre about preparing our students for will not even exist by the time that they get finished with college. And so um, we need for them to be career ready and prepare our students for non-routine jobs, those kinds of jobs that are going to exist in the future. And through this opportunity, um, we already have, of course, some connection with West Virginia Wesleyan, but we'd like to extend that to Glenville and Fairmont State and WBU and Shepherd and some of the other, a lot of the other colleges in the state and establish mentorships and, and uh, students will have some enrichment opportunities through those college visits. The last part of this, um, <coughs> this objective is um, to be able to do home visits for our students. Having a home visit extravaganza that would happen at the beginning of school. I know several other counties or several other schools in the county are having home visits this year and I remember a time when that was routine for all of us to go on home visits to see our students in their homes or to meet their parents and talk with them before school starts. And so that just extends our school community relationship that's so important to making a successful education experience for our students. Thank you, Ms. I'm Megan Baycorn. I teach fourth grade. And the last objective that Susan talked about with um, relationships, that third goal is um, developing relationships in, between the students, between the students and teachers, between the community as well. So one of the component, the last component, one of the last components of this grant is a service learning opportunity. And our students are very involved in our student council and they have community service, but we want to take it to the next level and have service learning to where there's a reflection piece. What have I benefited from, from doing this for someone else? And we thought of a population in our community that's very large and untapped, and that's our um, elderly in nursing homes. And so we wanted to foster some relationships in the nursing homes, have our students go and listen, have our students go and interview, have our students go and read, and try and build a relationship that way. And that also kind of goes on our grant this year with collecting oral histories, honoring our veterans when we do our Veterans Day celebration, 
and we're preparing an old-time radio show so that getting to hear about, well, when I was young, you know, this is what happened, and having our kids, you know, kind of recreate what culture was like for others and understanding their own culture and how it's changed. Um, another um, facet of this, this part of the grant is um, the mentoring relationships. Um, mentoring relationships between, um, we wanted to invite high school students and middle school students, and I think this will go very well with destination graduation. If we plan those um, visits on Fridays and Mondays so the kids wouldn't want to miss because I might miss my buddy that day. So helping with the dropout prevention rate if we have some accountability between a high school student or a middle school student and their little union buddy. And that would be through reading relationships, um, math tutoring, um, and also helps the high school and middle school student build some confidence and know that they're being counted on in just a different capacity than academics. Um, so we're wanting to um, foster those relationships and those cross-graded relationships will deepen more um, relationships and pr promote learning and uh, positive role models in the community. Thank you. We have our community partner here, Joyce Harris Thacker and the FRN and uh, Partners in Prevention. We do a lot of work with, with those two and she's already signed on as our community partner. And um, in addition to that, we've been offered, and although it hasn't been formalized, we have been offered a um, um, partnership with Glenville State College as a professional development school. So we're very excited about supporting these goals and objectives in our grants and our initiatives that we're currently doing um, in, with other activities such as uh, Brooke Scott's. Um, she just, we just learned that she received a $2,000 um, school garden grant. So we're very excited about that. And all of those things go right back to what we're talking about, these relationship building activities that foster student achievement. So we look forward to your support in this um, grant competition. Thank you. All of you all that put in the time and effort to do this. There's a lot of great things going on. Just one question. We, we saw in the civics uh, session here that uh, there was one homeschooled student who participated in that. It struck me on the library that if there's reading to be done, they would they could access the same reading at the library that your students would be doing. Okay. Absolutely. And the term Bill Daggett used, used for it was anytime learning, and it's through an electronic device that these students can take it anywhere <coughs> they can be learning. So. Do I hear a motion for approval of the innovation grant for the union? Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Thanks. We move on to item 13, which is approval of the goals for the board for 2012-13. Do you have anything on that? that you want to um, after we had our workshop meeting, I went back and, and took all your comments and suggestions and notes, and I think I've encompassed those into this document. I did change the format a little bit to make it consistent with the one that we had last year, and these are. Uh, although the, our board goals are already in policy, these will be performance evaluations uh, kinds of things, indicators on how we're reaching those goals. And, um, I think they're very, very solid. I appreciate the board's input on them. And we, as soon as they are approved, we will get them out to everybody and we'll, we'll start working on them. The Innovation Zone grants that we just heard about tonight, I think, fall right into our board expectations and board goals. We want to increase the graduation rate, reduce the dropout rate, and we want to create a culture of uh, relevance and rigor in our classrooms and, and enhance the community efforts and, and uh, with, the, with the community. We have the one goal in here, talks about the cultural significance in the, in the individual schools in their communities, which uh, Union has done and is, is continuing with this innovation zone. So uh, I think they're very good goals. I thought I think you did a great job putting them together. I did add on there as, as perhaps we didn't talk about at the 
at the workshop that we will have a midterm, mid-year progress report and put that on annually and report to the board how we're doing uh, with these. Comments or questions? Do I hear a motion to approve the goals? Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Um, we'll move on to the review and approval of the invitation to bid for the vending beverages. And that's attachment E. I'm assuming everyone's had a chance to read that. After our special meeting last week, of course, you directed us to create this document, and uh, we've, we've worked, Mr. Carver, Ms. Nestle Road, and uh, Rebecca Tinder worked very hard on creating this, making sure that it had all the components that we talked about, uh, made it a very viable document. It passes the legal muster. Uh, we did notice after we sent it out to you on Friday, we didn't get it completed until Friday evening, that there are some typos and some uh, issues in there that, uh, if indeed you choose to accept this, that we'll, we would like it to be accepted with the understanding that we'll clean those typos up and some, I think there's a couple of misspellings or grammatical errors that we want to go back and say. Yeah, consistency is title. Yeah, and, and there's a date in there. It talks about having the bids returned August 12th or August 2012. Obviously, we need to change those. Uh, Mr. Carver, any comments or uh, just that we, there were a couple main points that needed to be clarified. Uh, one was that the uh, products that were being purchased could be sold through a vending machine on a commission basis or at the schools on a wholesale pricing basis. Um, that the bids could be considered based on both the price of the product being offered and the amount of commission being uh, offered by the vendor. There was, some, there was one thing in the back about, um, it was a little bit confusing about uh, new products or equipment only in the bid specification. Uh, it was unclear as to whether that applied to just the product that was being delivered or to the vending machines that it was being sold in. So we added some language that just said that the vending machines had to be in good working order at all times uh, to, to separate that or segregate that from the product itself. So, I think we've addressed the main deficiencies in the original document. We can go out and get it again. Is there anything in there about the matrix that you all used to determine the bid of the way to bid? Um, the, the matrix is not really part of the bid process. It's it's a tool that you can use to evaluate it if the winner is not absolutely clear from the bid submitted. So it's not really part of the bid process. It's just a, a way of evaluating the bids after you get the can you make that make yourself a public a part of the public offering when you do this? Uh, certainly, that can be reviewed by any of the vendors. If you if you even have to use a matrix, because for instance, when we bid the last time, it was very very clear uh, between the uh, the beverage vendors who was the, the winner because they both bid the same exact price for the product, and the only difference was the amount of commission. Offered, there was no need to do a matrix because it was clear who the winner was. So the matrix is just used to, to quantify the things that you're looking at in the bid to determine who the I realize that, but it, it was a bone of some contention right. the last time. Folks said they didn't know they were being uh, evaluated on this matrix. So if we're going to use a matrix uh, or have the possibility of using a matrix, I wonder if it shouldn't be a part of this document so that people know if it's close, here's how we evaluate it. Um, in one draft, we had percentages in there, and, and uh, Ms. Tinder thought that that kind of took away your ability to have uh, your judgment in there that made it strictly a mathematical calculation instead of having you have some judgment in, in not which vendor you wanted to select. So we removed that those percentages because it would have just made it a, a mechanical process rather than a judgment call on part of the board. So maybe we don't need a matrix, so we'll Yeah. I mean it, it wouldn't be needed in every 
in every case. Only when there's a not a clear one, or or if it's very very close and you need to, to document how you arrived at the decision. Well, that's why I'm wondering if we should include it in this document if in fact we may end up using one, just so that everybody's clear that this is what we might use. Here's how we determine that. With the change in the wording that we used, uh, that we have under the evaluation of bids. <coughs> help clarify a little bit on how or what we're looking at. I know yeah, in the, I the original, yeah, the in the original that document, that was a big bone you, of contention you, there. Yeah, you have to meet that hurdle of submitting the bid and meeting the bid specs before you're even considered uh, to be a viable bidder. Uh, so really you're just down to the, the price and the uh, amount of commission third item is whatever's in the best interest of the board. So it should be pretty clear who the winner is with that point of matrix. Yeah, I took it when reading this, um, the change in that section on the evaluation of bid helped clarify a lot that we were had a lot of discussion over in that last one. Clearly, it's your document. If you want to have a matrix as part of it, we certainly incorporate well, I don't really want a matrix to be part of it. I just think if we're going to use it, it should be part of it. If we don't make it part of it, then we shouldn't use it. And that's just the way I feel. But it's, a, it's unfair to folks who think that they're bidding and this is all they're going to be using, and then you throw out a matrix and they, they don't quite understand it. It's obvious that one of the bidders didn't understand the matrix. So uh, I just don't think we should use it. When they bid on this, do we share with them that the, there's that possibility that we do use a matrix? I mean, I don't know that it needs to be part of the invitation to bid, but is that information shared in any way? I'm, I'm hopeful that the document is clear that okay, no. when the bids come in, it will be clear who the winner is and we won't even need to deal with that. <laughs> I think Cindy, Cindy was hopeful that the last time we put the bids out. I have a question as far as there isn't anything in that agreement discussing any kind of liability. I mean, do we do we ask vendors to sign a hold harmless agreement? Or? Is that in the state policy that they have to adhere to? That they have to provide in order to be a business, they have to have the liability. Insurance. Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure if there's anything in here that says they have to provide proof of insurance. It's that. not in this document, but anytime right. we go to an outside contract or something, we always do they, do they sign a hold they, harmless they'll agreement? Have, they'll submit an insurance or something. I don't know that we actually have a hold harmless agreement, but it's that's, certainly that's, something we probably that's should something that I think Because anytime somebody steps on our front, the school board should look into They usually furnish a copy of their liability Their insurance. liability insurance is yeah. what they is what we, we probably should add a statement. But we can put that in here in the cover letter that goes out. Right. Just add that statement. Just add that in the cover letter. Not necessarily have it in the proof agreement work itself. Or right. or yeah. Something. Yeah. Okay. So is everyone comfortable with that? that? Just add that statement in the cover letter. Right. And make, actually make, make it. the, the uh, typo changes and who we include. I just had one other question I, I noticed in our bids that we got previously that the one bidder submitted photocopies of every label of every product that we were bidding, we were bidding on. Uh, the other one didn't. And I notice here in this bid document it says that nutritional labels are required. Is that before or after we accept their bid? Should they be sending that in with their bid as the one bidder did but the other didn't? 
Pardon? I think they should be sent in where we have the, uh, the, the actual documentation of what that is. It's a usually a common product that you can find that information. Most of the time, the labels are sent in or the information is put in that form that's on there, and uh, that's verified, actually, mm -hmm. because it's usually common product in the house, just so you know. Well, I like the way that, that one vendor sent that in. I think it's, it, it verifies you exactly what they're giving you. It's, it's, what's on, it's the label itself. And, uh, I wonder if we shouldn't require that actual photocopy of the label of the, of the items you're selling us. That way there's no question, no typos. Is that something we've gotten in the past from other vendors? I think we have, but I don't know that it, but I don't know if it comes in with the bid or if it's after the bid is awarded as a verification. That they're, well, it's they're not clear respects. here when it's supposed to come in. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're supposed to submit it, but it, it's not really clear when. It just says standard bid conditions, and doesn't really say whether they do that with the bid or if they get the bid. It says just prior to the products being placed in the machines. So we address that. Yeah. All right. Yes. That. Could you step up a little yeah. bit? Yeah. yeah. Believe I, it or I not, there's an air conditioner on. Because products <laughs> change so often and the sizes they change. That's why Miss Tinder tried to make everything so tightened up in the specs when it was through there. Because they could turn in, let's say, a six ounce something product, and the vendors actually change, let's say Frito Lay or whoever, whatever it is. The main requirement is it continually meets those state requirements that set forth in our policy of nutrition. So basically, what they're doing is before they put it in, they sub product sometimes. There's no way they could actually always turn that in. They have to make sure it requires, and that's why we have people go check the machines so often, and I have to go up and do reviews. But what they're turning in is their initial thing that they're bidding on, and the products sometimes change. Don't they have to submit to you if it changes? Yes, and it, said, it says... Before they put it in there? Yes. Well, what they normally do is they call me, or I'll call and say, this. there was something at the middle school, let's say, that shouldn't have been there. And... Um, and it was sometimes it's just a little bit of a language. It's usually turned right around. And um, they normally, um, in the past, at least for what went in the machines at the high school, I would get a phone call or my secretary would. She would get out those laws. We would look at the ounces of fat and we would say yes or no on that particular product. Well, you start out with the basic what the bid is going to be. And then sometimes products do change. It's even just sizes. Or the state law changes. Like we had a certain amount of juice that we could do and then that changed and we can no longer keep that. So when do you get these nutritional labels? They submit an, a, a bid package with their basic amount of what they're going to do, give their main products in pretty much specific categories and then we look at that. So that is a good package? Yes. Now they probably... Yeah, and I have suggested that. They can actually take that label and go to the state website and calculate, like put in the ounces, and it will tell them whether it's a good or a bad immediately. And we usually have a parent volunteer try to be checking those along with me to make sure what we have meets those requirements. And this bid response form has all of the things that they have listed to the products that's in lieu of the label. Well, or you can submit the label. But now this all is all that information has to be standard bid condition. Either we're going to do it on every bid or we're not. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't say any place that you can do that in lieu of. Well, they have to provide proof that the, that the product meets the specifications. And the label would be the best thing to do that, along with the written. I mean, that must be why they have that written as well as submit the label. That way it can be verified. But, but either way, we can determine where they get the specs. Oh, yeah. And if I understand it right, what Ms. Nusselrode said is when they submit this, even it could change before they bring the product to the machine. 
because there may be substitutions or changes from their vendors. So, but we do have checks in place to cover that. Right. Any other questions? So, do I hear a motion to um, approve the bid document with all corrections and? Include in the cover letter the statement. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? And thank you. That was a quick turnaround for that. Very quick turnaround. <coughs> uh, we'll move on to personnel attachment F. We had a chance to look at um, the updated copy that was given to you. And do I hear a motion that we approve those personnel items as requested? Motion to approve. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And we move on. We have a second set of personnel issues. And I wish to make a statement. Uh, I, Alan Suter, recuse myself from any discussion or voting procedures uh, due to personnel issues with uh, B. Stankis, do you have a signature page with you in your packet? Could I? Could you leave one here with us? And we'll... I will. I'll change Because we. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Or I can fax it to you. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. We'll move on. Uh, preliminary West test results, Mr. Wager. Funny thing happened on the way to the board meeting. <coughs> I was actually, I'm sorry I was late, I was actually meeting with parents at a school um, when Mr. Lampinen asked me if he could put it on the agenda to talk about West Tests. I had already sent 900 letters out to parents for school of choice and then Mr. Lampinen got an email saying that it's embargoed till Wednesday. It's a little late <clears throat> since we've already sent the letters out. So basically what I'm going to tell you is not a whole lot other than we do. Uh, the good news is that two of our four schools that did not make AYP and the elementary schools made AYP this year. So that's a good thing. Two schools still did not, and they are now schools of choice. So I had to send letters out as required by federal law to those parents. I've had meetings with both schools' parents. So it's public knowledge, at least for those two schools, that they did not make AYP. Um, good thing is, though, in coming from the one meeting I just came from, that no parent chose to leave that school. And at the uh, other school, I only had one parent that chose to leave the school. So um, you can probably figure out. <laughs> Since it's public knowledge. Well, it's only public to those two schools the because they're the ones. <laughs> French Creek and um, and McCann Academy did not make AYP. Uh, Rock Cave and Tenerton, who did not make AYP last year, did. And then the other two, the other three elementary schools, stayed, also having made AYP. So we're excited about those preliminary results. But I, I will do a formal presentation at the next board meeting if you 
wish. But it was kind of interesting after we done all this work. I was trying to do it because I did not want, if we were going to have any parents that chose to move their children, I did not want to wait until after school started. Because it's kind of, it, as I explained to the parents, it's not really fair to the kids to have them in school for a week. And then the parent says, I want to move. And then they're uprooted, and uh, some, some counties didn't get the AYP results, and they've already started school, because they started earlier than us. So their kids are already in school, and they're now getting ready to have those meetings to discuss school choice, which is required by law. And also, Pecan Academy will also be offering supplemental educational services, which is tutoring services uh, that Title I is to pay for. I will be sending out letters to the parents, another letter, to the parents, uh, giving them options as to what supplemental services are available. Most of it involves online computer uh, tutoring services or something similar to Sylvan, where the parents can take them there and then Title I pays the tuition for them to go till the money runs out. We've budgeted so much for that. So at that point, then we'll be doing it. But I can give you more information on that at the next meeting. So I don't know. What other than well, the preliminary results are five out of our nine schools uh, have made AYP, which is up from last year, so the improvement is there. And although Buchanan Academy, for instance, is on their third year, uh, they're still making strides and we're still moving forward with that. But we did receive from the state superintendent an email the other day that uh, at first it said we were going to re release those at the end of last week, and then we, <coughs> since we put it on the agenda, received another one uh, that says not until Thursday is their anticipated date of release. We have a nine o'clock in the morning webinar with the folks from Charleston to talk about the AYP and the public release uh, thereof. So we'll make that release and as soon as we have all those details, we'll, we'll get it out to you and the public. Right. And like I said, we only sent the letters out, so this, those two schools know exactly where they are, where they stay, so. But, and it was, it was a good meeting, actually, with both sets of parents. That's what it's the same. And that's preliminary data, even though, it, for instance, the middle school, uh, once again, because of <coughs> middle school, it's tough for middle schools. But their achievement levels continue to rise. Yeah. And as we move forth, and, and as we've talked about before, the, the state is going to be sending in a waiver to the federal government and move towards an improvement model, where we'll rate our schools based on the improvement that they made, not a, just a hard, fast score. Uh, which we think is the way to go because in education we're all about our students learning and improving. So we're, we're, we're hopeful of that. And what's kind of what's kind of interesting is like being in French Creek this evening and talking to the parents. I probably had eight parents there. Um, I didn't know if they really wanted to move the children. They came because it was an informational meeting, and we we talked about what was going on at the school and what the school's doing to improve scores. Uh, and uh, Mrs. Johnson, the principal, has been really working hard with the staff. They have been showing improvement, but not enough. Uh, the parents had some wonderful questions. They had some great suggestions, actually, that we're going to discuss. And about half the staff actually stayed to hear the, my presentation to the parents also. Then I excused all the teachers because I didn't want parents to feel uncomfortable if they did want to move their child. So I told teachers to get out, <laughs> the principal. And, but the, but at, at the end, none of them chose to move. They said, this is our school, this is our, we raised our kids here, this is our community, we want to stay here. It just says, it says a lot for French Creek. Yeah. So we'll look forward to hearing from you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll move on to delegations. Thank you for having me. See. I guess I should first ask um, a question. Mr. Lampinen, does the county have any kind of a policy on trying to keep, like, business local versus sending it out of the county, out of the state, whatever? We, we have a, a, I don't know if it's an actual written policy that talks about Upshur County per se, but what we try to encourage our schools to do and anybody is to, is to purchase locally every time you can. And right. if, if things, all things are equal, and we can we can help our local merchants. We certainly do. Okay. Um, the reason I ask, many of you probably already know me. If not, I own a gown shop called Crown and Touch. And as of January last this well this year right now, um, we moved it downtown onto North Canal Street. In addition to 
them getting the crowning touchdown in that neighborhood, the Market Bistro has since moved down there. But we've also been blessed in that we've got a couple new businesses in Buchanan. One of them would be Hibbit Sports, which is out past Walmart. I know a lot of people think the world ends there, but it really doesn't. If you go on out, you find a few other things. And um, the other thing would be a lady from Harrison County, Gabby Purnell, purchased um, Cheer One, which is a gymnastics facility in downtown Buchanan. I know her because her daughter always used to come and get homecoming and prom gowns from me. Um, of course, her daughter's grown up and moved on now, and she said I had to have something to do. So, now, as I understand it, she has one gym maybe in Harrison County, and then she opened the one here. In any case, the good thing is Buchanan is growing. The downside is the economy hasn't been that great. So those of us who are small businesses, um, we do struggle. And what makes it really hard for me, I was always raised when I was a child and they wanted us to sell stuff. My parents always sent me out to do it. I didn't, sometimes my dad would help, but nine times out of 10, I went out to do it. Therefore, when a kid comes in and asks me as a business person to donate, contribute, support, buy, whatever, I always try to do it. Um, it's real hard, however, when you've got a, a, someone coming in from a group or an organization and you know that that group organization never does business locally. Um, I've run into that. I'll give you a couple good examples. Knowing that being on the homecoming court is, for some families, a financial hardship. Um, it's a tremendous honor, but it's all, it also can be a, a, a hardship. Suddenly you're faced with dressy clothes for parades and for the athletic field. You're faced with needing a gown for the coronation. And I think that's wonderful because it does teach the kids to dress up a little bit more, plus the dress clothes part. They're going to be able to use those items later. The problem is there would be an ideal opportunity for local businesses to make a little bit of money, but not when it all goes out of town. So several years ago, when I was still operating out of my home, um, I put together a letter, took it to the schools, and what it does is it congratulates the girls on making the court and it offers every single one of them $100 off the price of any evening gown and it also offers them $50 off the price of any suit. Now, some people may be under the impression, well, but how much difference does that make? Yes, there are gowns out there and I'm not going to lie to you, the girls that do pageants, you can purchase gowns that run into the thousands of dollars, but for homecoming, the average homecoming dress would be probably between $150 and maybe $300. And that difference is based totally on the person's particular taste. It's much like, and I, I'm going to pick on the lady sitting up here, the three of you, it might be just like when you go to purchase a handbag. Some of you may be very price conscious and some of you may want that designer label. So it, again, it, it just depends on what your personal preference is. Anyway took the letters up to the high school. Well, I was disappointed to find out that there were a couple situations at hand. Number one, we're up against a teacher, and I don't know who she is. I, I deliberately told the kid that told me, I don't want to know. Um, but we're up against a teacher who was actually handing out flyers promoting a gown shop in Morgantown. Well, you know, everybody's schedule's tight enough. So, I mean, Driving into the next county would be one thing, but that's asking them to drive more than an hour up the road to purchase what they can probably get here in Upshur County. The second thing we ran into was people saying, well, there's no need to look in Buchanan. You can't find anything here. Well, good heavens, if we all develop that attitude, there's not going to be any place to eat. There's not going to be, basically, we're going to get up, we're going to go to work, we're going to go to school, and that's all we're going to do in Buchanan because the businesses will all be gone. Um, I talked to the manager at Hibbett Sports, and they were disappointed because evidently, and I don't know how this works, I know nothing about athletics, I was what they used to call a band geek. Um, but the manager at Hibbett Sports has been disappointed because they haven't even been asked to give a price on any of the shoes for any of the teams. Do, and, and I'm not being a smart aleck, I really don't know. I thought, like, the basketball team or the baseball team, I thought they all wore shoes that match. Do they not do that anymore? Some do. Some do, some do not. Where do they get the shoes? It depends on the program. Some parents go out and get their own shoes and some are ordered as a group. Okay. Well, I knew 100 years ago, back in the 80s, when my nephew played 
the coach would usually say, this is the shoe, this is the brand, this is, and then nine times out of 10, they had a deal going with somebody and got them locally. But anyway, the manager at Hibbett Sports is extremely interested in having an opportunity, and they've got a great program out there too. If you purchase the first time and you sign up for their free low point card, just like the Kroger Plus card, you get 20% off. And I have found that they carry all the same shoes you get in another county, you can just get them a little bit cheaper. Cheer one, I spoke with Gabby Purnell last night, and she said she was kind of disappointed because evidently, and again, I was in band, I don't know this, but evidently the cheerleaders are required to take gymnastics. And she thought maybe by opening her facility here, the kids wouldn't have to drive into another county and you know, you've got the liability issue. Evidently, they're all still running to Harrison County. I, I guess what I'm asking is, is there anything that can be done to encourage the teachers, the parents, et cetera, to at least give those of us that are here a chance first? And, and maybe you'll find that we've got the same products. We might even have a better price. I know that when I have had people come in, if they are on a budget, being a small business, being local, I'll do everything I can to get them in under their budget. I'm sure a lot of these other places will too, but I think we ought to be utilizing our, our local resources first. So what can we do? Well, as I told you on the phone, uh, well, we, we do have a policy that, first of all, let me address the flyers that went out. Uh, and it would be the same holds true of your flyer if you chose to send one out. Uh, all those should come down to our office first to be sure that we, we review them and they, they meet our standards uh, before they're sent out. So if, if someone is putting out a local flyer or for some, a flyer for someone else, uh, that should go through the principal's office in ours. So we have to articulate that policy perhaps a little, a little bit better. As far as shoes for athletic teams and whatnot, many times that's up to the individual parent as to where. But I do, I do see your point on if there's a way to get things here locally. Now, I've not spoken to the gentleman, and I don't know if the schools have from Hibbets. I don't know if they went up and talked to the school or not. But we certainly want to support our local businesses, and you have our commitment on that. However, there are, there are contracts that are in place in some instances uh, that just much the same as some of the things that we've been dealing with here uh, that are renewable on a year-to-year -year basis. And we've just had that conversation with one school on, on a different issue. Uh, so we would support and we encourage our people to go locally when they can. We do not have a policy that says you have to purchase from Buchanan merchants or Upshur County merchants first. But it is a philosophy that I think we all adhere to like to and we'll work hard to make sure that work gets one other thing i would suggest and this again may or may not affect my business um i know that usually it changes whichever teacher's in charge of homecoming like at the school i've heard the parents growling a little bit the last few years it used to be when pat marsh did it she was very thorough and once let's say she made the homecoming court she'd be called in she'd be given a letter it would go to her parents telling them what was what the parents were invited to, the schedule, et cetera. Pat would also take the time to mention to the parents what was suggested as far as their attire. A lot of these parents have no idea. They don't go to the ball games. They don't know. And I've heard some of the parents say they would like to be given guidelines and suggestions on that, too. I think that's fair. And I also have to, have to comment that we in the school system, the reason they come down to us is we cannot be an advertising agency for every business, whether it's a local business or out. So right. we, we do scrutinize that and we, we see what the benefit is for the student there. Um, and you, you could have, Alyssa, you could have just as many people that want to go to your shop mm -hmm. that don't want to go to your mm -hmm. shop. So we can't be in a position and, sit and mandate that everybody well, go there. Saying, but uh, certainly see with what the you're parents, the parents would appreciate guidelines as to, for like the fathers, we would suggest dress slacks, khakis, even stuff they could get at Walmart versus, because some people don't know, you've seen past year's homecoming, we've seen everything on the ladies from cocktail dresses to denim because they didn't have any guidelines. I'm just saying that might be an idea too to add a list of suggestions. Well, I agree. We want to support our local businesses. and I and I know we do have a couple of the sports teams that have gone to Hibbets in the last little bit. Um, maybe what we need to do is reiterate to the principals and, and, and those at the different schools what 
the guidelines we, are. We will certainly do that. And as far as getting homecoming guidelines out, that, that those with all due honesty and respect, those are school issues that, that the, the, the uh, school administration has to look at and see what they're going to accept and what they're not going to accept. And I will tell you from experience, if I can, in Upshur High School, uh, when you do set those, those guidelines, you always have somebody that doesn't want to adhere to those guidelines, and then you put yourself in a position of saying, should that child be allowed to come into the homecoming dance? Uh, and then you go to the reasoning, well, it doesn't meet our standards, should we send them home? And the other side of that is if mom and dad are willing to let them go out of the house that way. Uh, so I, I agree with the standards, I agree with the suggestions, uh, but it's a little bit different than it used to be when the basketball coach said everybody's gonna wear Chuck Taylor uh, converse black uh, those days we, we don't have the authority to, to necessarily do that unless we're supplying this for, for the students so it does go both ways but I don't want to digress from the point you're making we do support and yes. we want our schools to support our local merchants as often as it's possible yeah because then it makes it easier for us if, if we follow the business we can give donations absolutely and you know in light of the fact that we expect all the citizens especially local businesses that support us to, to donate. We go to levy times, take the extra taxes, and then we have always gone for donations. Uh, I don't think there'd be anything wrong with uh, a letter generator from the board to every school I, principal. I think that's uh, a great idea. Expressing our desire that they exhaust every effort to shop locally and spend locally. I'll, I'll draft that letter and get it out to you all for free and review. That's yeah. a great I idea. think we definitely want to support. Well, and, and I mean, I'll give an example. When my husband and I went to buy a car, we used the USA military program. What we were wanting, we tried. We tried so hard to buy it locally. When we couldn't get it in Upshur County, I even called two other dealerships, two of the biggest in West Virginia. They didn't want to. They did not want to deal with the military program. Thus, we ended up in Virginia picking up our car. Well, there was a several thousand dollar difference. If you can't get it, if it's not here, and if the price isn't there, I fully understand going someplace else. Just give us a shot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Move on to board member comments. I would say I think that the uh, convocation went very well as well. I really appreciate it. I thought it was fine. I thought this presentation was well done, as was everyone's. Well, we'll receive it also. Thank you. Have anything else? All right. Our next meeting date will be September the 11th, 7 o'clock, here at McCannon Academy. Thank you all. We're going to be going into executive session with personnel. Do I hear a motion to go into executive session? Motion to go into executive session, West Virginia Code, section 69A, 4, 2, 8. Second. Now in executive session.